Okay. Good. Misunderstood. Yeah. People think that you said something disparaging about the children you've been fighting for. Our it's different, and it's yeah, it's a bad. It's bad. absolutely um, killing. And I just have to get over it. It'll pass. It, it, it pass. will. It Is will. There anything I can do? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you want us like? Here, let's go. Here, let's go. No, no, please don't. Yeah. <laughs> please. Definitely not. not yeah. Definitely not. Welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you're here, and I know that uh, people are going to be trickling in after that wonderful um, series of three great um, discussions uh, at the lunch. Just love it. And then the conversation afterwards, that was just really wonderful. Um, Rahima, Irvin, um, and Sean, they really brought it, so we really appreciate it. And we appreciate you coming to this discussion. My name's Laurie Calvert, I'm the Education Policy Advisor for Learning Forward, and I am a former teacher, 14-year English teacher from North Carolina, and I'm National Board Certified and even renewed, and so I am so glad to have some of my heroes here. I was an NEA member. Even the first three years in Washington, I kept my membership just because I thought I might need the union when I went back. <laughs> <laughs> so it is so great. We have never had on the Learning Forward uh, stage both of the union leads here. The, and so we are so excited and blessed to have two people who are so passionate about education and educators who want to do the right thing for children. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about this topic of how teachers can lead and own professional learning is also something we've been working on at Learning Forward. Um, we're going to have a white paper coming out this spring on the importance of teacher agency, so this is perfect timing on this. And it's an issue that's very, very close to my heart, so we're so glad you're here to hear about it. Um, we have with us today Randy Weingarten, you know her as the president of the 1.6 million member American Federation of Teachers. She's um, feeling a little under the weather, but she's promised not to nod off, and she said she hasn't gotten anybody sick in the last few days, so. Um, At least still, not physically sick. <laughs> yeah, if you shake hands, I still would probably wash. Um, <laughs> Before Randy was um, the AFT president, she was the, uh, 12, for 12 years as the president <laughs> of the UFT, AFT Local 2 in New York City. And, and we are just so, so excited to have her. I recently saw when, uh, Randy speak at uh, Joe Almeida's event, um, and I love how she is really honestly there for the teachers and always urging us to talk to the teachers not just the organizations um, who are formed to sort of prove that we've been listening to teachers, but actually to talk to the teachers themselves, and I really appreciated that. We've also got with us um, Lily Eskelson Garcia, who is the president of the NEA, and you know, you may or may not know that Lily began her career as the school lunch lady, so look how far we've come. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I don't like it when I see um, in some of her credentials that like she's one of the most effective Latina um, presenters because I think she's one of the most effective speakers I've ever seen publicly. Um, and so it doesn't matter um, what group she represents except that I'm so glad she's here for the teachers. Uh, Lily was also a Utah Teacher of the Year, so she really knows um, what she's speaking about. So it's really great to have them here, these strong advocates for our nation's teachers, urging us to uh, policymakers and school leaders to listen to teachers around their professional learning. Now moderating the event today is Lynn Olson. Lynn is the advisor to the director of the College Ready Program at the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, she's responsible for strategic relationships management um, with some of the cross-cutting ready, college ready partners and two of the partners are the National Teachers Union, so it only makes sense 
that she's the person here to uh, moderate this discussion. So Lynn's gonna moderate the panel and we're gonna hear from uh, Lily and Randy and then uh, in the last 20 minutes or so we'll have a Q&A from the audience and I'll come back for that. Great, so Thank good you. afternoon everyone. Um, so uh, I have a cold as well, so if you hear a sniffling up here, apologies in advance. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, the foundation. We put her in the middle, right there. <laughs> the foundation for the last couple of years has really been listening closely to teachers. And one of the things we consistently hear from teachers when we ask them about professional learning is that they want professional learning that is relevant, interactive, sustained, job embedded, and teacher led. And I think part of that is because teachers consistently tell us. Uh, nobody knows teaching like teachers, and they want to learn from each other. Um, so I'm really pleased to have here today uh, the leaders of both national teachers unions to talk about teacher-led professional learning and the role of the unions in helping their members learn. So um, you know, I thought I'd start by asking both of you, uh, what are you hearing from your members, either through surveys, focus groups, your conversations as you're traveling around the country, about what they value in professional learning. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll start because we've said the word teacher many, many times and there's so many support staff uh, that are all in the education family. And I love it when folks say I started out as a, a lunch lady. I don't necessarily think that there's a, a ladder that I climbed. We were all there for the kids. Um, and if you want to know how to make sure you have a healthy school building that's clean and has good ventilation, you should talk to the custodian. Um, if you want to know how to really um, light kids' uh, eyes on, uh, like stars about the joy of learning, you ask a teacher, you ask that person that has to plan the lesson plan. So what we're hearing from our members um, at NEA, um, and what I'm sure is no different with uh, AFT because we're all in the same family, uh, first of all, the frustration of 14 long, painful years of no child left untested, where we had both hands tied behind our back. Uh, where it was a test and punish regime, where they felt like they were the ones, the last ones who were asked about what to do. We're about to end that national nightmare and take a look at something that really makes sense. We'll have a lot of work cut out for us, um, should all go according to plan this week. Um, but having teacher leaders, having people that have real authority, real ability to collaborate, to do all the things that you just mentioned, um, to really say, how do we personalize education on that building level where a leader isn't someone who ran for something uh, in, in their union uh, or has necessarily doctor in front of their name. A leader is someone who says, I step forward with my ideas and I'm able to convince my colleagues that there's something that we should be doing in our school to serve all of our students. Randy, how about you? What are you hearing from your members specifically about what they want to see in terms of professional learning? So um, uh, three sources. We did this big survey with the um, badass teachers last, um, I guess it was last spring, summer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'll go through the results in a sec. And then we also just canvassed about 350 of our members, leaders, and trainers in about 101 locals in 27 states. Thank you very much, Lisa, for giving me those stats because I would never have remembered that. Um, and we also have, you know, lots of different, um, I'm in about a local a week and we've actually in the last few weeks have actually talked to about a thousand of our leaders through some member engagement stuff. So from all of that, on the negative side is exactly what, what um, Lil has said, that it's just this sense of the last 15 years increasingly of test, 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 punish, punish, punish. I don't have the latitude to do what I need to do for kids. So, but once you get through that, you start getting to, well, what would work? And, and, and people are starting to think about 
what it is that they would like to see, as opposed to actually acting, I'm not quite sure how to say this in English, in this kind of crouch position still of, of saying, oh my God, get everybody away from me so I can close the door and just teach again. So what, what we're hearing when you kind of get through the stress and get through the, oh my God, I don't, I'm on this assembly line and I can't get off of it and all that matters is the test score. When they say, okay, what is it that you need? It comes down to time, tools, trust. And I love the word agency. And when, and they want professional development, including their own generated professional development, they want it to be relevant, they want it to be teacher-led, they want to have the time to actually do it with each other and then try a lesson and then have some feedback from it. So it's actually not, so, so the words that you used before, relevant, interacted, interactive, job embedded, teacher led, they, they'll use different words, but that's what they want. And they want it to be real, not just somebody off the shelf coming in for 22 minutes and saying, okay, this is the introductory lesson, now go do it. I, you know, I know uh, with the Common Core that both of your organizations actually thought quite a lot about what your members needed um, and have worked both on teacher crafted Common Core line lessons for other teachers, changing some of the professional development. You're actually offering to your members. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about um, what you've done to support your members in terms of the shifts in the Common Core? You know, it's, it's been very controversial, as I, I don't have to tell um, any audience of educators whether or not um, the Common Core is, you know, the best thing is sliced, since sliced bread or, um, you know, evil. Uh, and, and there's not a lot of people in the middle. But I know where the uh, members and leaders of the NEA who say, we see great possibilities for this. We're actually seeing people change the way that they approach their learning, is where they took the time to really um, train teachers to know what the Common Core was and how to approach it. The more autonomy that you gave the professional the more they saw it as an asset. The more you took away, uh, it will, we'll tell you the book, we'll give you the curriculum, uh, be, everybody's gonna be on page 73, and by the way, before we even tell you what's in it, we're going to uh, call you effective or ineffective based on some cut score with a test that may or may not even be aligned to it. So the more that they um, um, cut the professional leader teacher out of it, the more a failure it was. So when we go to when we go to those states that said, what um, what can any A do to help? We worked with Better Lesson. We worked with saying, how do we get the people who know the names of the kids to develop the um, lesson plans that um, they actually tried out in their own classrooms and had some success with. So that there's videos, there's, there's um, things that are very hands-on. It's not ivory tower. We had over 16,000 lessons that you can go to up on, on Better Lessons. And we, uh, I told them just before I came, I said, how many hits of um, people have been up there looking at 2.3 million people, uh, well not people, but times, uh, folks have gone up there and said, I'm looking for something that my colleagues developed. So saying that it's um, teacher developed and um, that some teacher actually tried it out in his or her own classroom has been um, phenomenal. Yeah, and Randy, you've had some teacher developed lessons as well, right? right. Can you talk a little bit? About that? So um, first, first we actually tried to do a lot of face-to-face -face development with both leaders as well as members um, during summers and things like that. And all of that is extraordinarily effective, but really costly. And trying to figure out how to do that within our budgets um, and, and, and within the time the teachers need because, so, so we're wrestling with how to find a way to do a combination of online 
as well as face-to-face. Face-to-face is very important. Online will never substitute for face-to-face, but trying to figure that, that kind of hybrid. Um, in 2012, we launched something called Share My Lesson. We did it with a British company. Um, we're actually launching a second version of it by ourselves because a British company wanted to monetize and we didn't want to monetize. Um, we really wanted this to be for free. Um, and that second um, iteration is um, coming out on December 20th, so we're better testing it. We will, but what has happened is we have over 300,000 lessons, um, some of which we did through our innovation fund, just like NEA did with Better Lesson. We did with several different locals who actually did units of lessons um, so that people saw a sequence. That actually worked much better than the isolated lessons. Um, and it's one of the reasons why New York's Engage New York didn't work, because separate and apart from everything else, it was an isolated lesson, not a lesson in sequence. Um, there's over almost 900,000 people on Share My Lesson now. It's for free, it's for everyone. No one has to be a member of the AFT, and no one has to give us anything but your state and your zip code. Um, and what the new, the new um, platform um, is, it does a bunch of things that the old platform didn't do in terms of creating communities, making it easier to upload, on and on and on. Over 10 million downloads. And, the, and, and just like Lily said, the lessons that were created by teachers um, that, 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 that they did as groups and as locals are the ones that get downloaded the most. Like, um, uh, uh, lessons for the 21st century from someone from the Boston Teachers Union. There's been 500,000 downloads of that sequence of math and social studies lessons. How, you know, as you um, are talking particularly to your younger members and new teachers, um, how are you thinking about the union's role in professional learning and is the way you're thinking about it changing or has it changed over time? Um, there is, there's many things. First of all, we have at NEA a student member program so that if you are on a college campus and you're studying to be a teacher, you can join the NEA student program. Uh, for a lot of our um, student members, because they're only there for a year or two, uh, as they, uh, usually just before they do their student teaching, um, but they'll say that going to an NEA conference or going up on our website uh, or the chapters on their own campuses are um, as useful to them as any class that they take. There is, for especially those first year teachers, um, a woeful lack of mentor programs of any, I mean, we all remember our first year's uh, first year teaching. It was my most productive year, of course, um, where you just think, I'm, I'm hoping that nobody's watching me because you're flying by the seat of your pants too often. And there's, there's um, too many situations that you couldn't have covered in an undergraduate program or in your student teaching. So we've been working with Teach Cycle um, as well. Uh, where you have a mentor, a coach, uh, someone online, someone that you can say, okay, I'm, I'm really nervous about this. I might have really messed this up. Help me with uh, going forward. Um, when I first started teaching in 1980, None of Your Business, I was um, lucky to have um, an incredible tight faculty that we all became really close friends. Um, we didn't have time for collaboration and mentor and induction programs. We had third lunch where we'd all sit together and just kind of talk about, you know, what am I going to do with Lonnie? Um, and we'd give each other advice and say, try this. I had Lonnie's brother, you know. Luck is a lousy business plan. You really do need to have someone thoughtfully say, how do I, what do I do on that undergraduate program to have kids have a very meaningful um, experience? I love that Finland has a residency program. I wish we did. Um, and then that first year induction, where you say, where is the mentor? And not just someone where you go, Lynn, it's your turn to be the mentor for, where you really have a trained program and some 
um, ability for that first year teacher to feel like I'm not all alone. I'm not, um, it's not a sink or swim. Randy, um, you and then back to Lily, are, are there things though that your union itself is doing differently in terms of professional learning that you're doing now that you weren't doing a couple years ago? Ways that you're thinking about it differently? Yes. So, um, first off, it's now part of the mainstream of the union. Um, I used to do a little chart when I was the UFT president, and we had this great teacher center, um, which was in several schools, but we would put the um, grievances, grievances, um, fighting for a contract, um, understanding pensions, understanding salary, that were here. And the teacher center was here. And part of what we're doing in terms of the AFT is putting all of it together and trying to figure out multiple pathways within which people are engaged. So we're, we have actually started doing a very, very big member engagement program to reach, this is our 100th anniversary, 100% of our members. Talk with, not talk to, talk with 100% of our members. Double the number of activists, triple the number of people who are engaged. And part of it, the, the kind of work we're doing is that there are lots of different ways of engagement. Teacher leaders, share my lesson, um, the uh, politics, uh, community engagement, racial justice. So what we're seeing is that um, millennials get gripped in a very different way. Have the same, if have a very amazing view of their place in the world, but you need to actually kind of catch them in a different way. They have more confidence than people who came into teaching 10, 20, 30 years ago. They're not as willing to be infantilized. And in some ways, you get to the relevance quickly, and they'll say, this is good, this is bad. So we're, so this has now become one of the real avenues, turning around low-performing schools, um, mentoring, lesson planning, PD. But I want to go back to something that, that Lily said as I end, which is that they also want not just the national union, but what are you going to do on a local level to actually really help me not just get a decent wage, but really help me feel confident about my profession and about what I'm doing and the latitude. And so I think actually more and more of these residency programs, more of these career ladders, trying to figure out how you bargain it in states that can, that it's very refreshing because there's a, there's, um, there's a sense of, I can do it, give me a few skills, give me a few ideas, and I'm gonna bang that door down. And um, you know, it's a great point. Are, you know, are either of you seeing uh, locals or state affiliates where they've really made sort of professional learning and teaching sort of a core part of now the way they're interacting with members? And can you give a concrete example of that? I can point to a concrete example of that. Sitting right here in the second row, Carrie Dahlman, uh, yes, who is the state affiliate uh, president of, uh, in Colorado, the Colorado Education Association. And um, where I, we could have many of your colleagues sitting here uh, as well saying, this is now part and parcel of what we do. What we do to prepare teachers, what we do for induction programs are things that we want in state law. They're things that we want in a contract. They're things that our members, and not just our brand new members, there are, these are things that are experienced members are saying, this is important to my profession. And uh, it's just as likely that you can go to a local uh, in Colorado or to the uh, headquarters in the Colorado Education Association. Um, and it is very different than you would have found 30 years ago. Randy, did you just yes. an example come to mind for you? Three quick ones. ABC School District in um, right um, in LA County, but right under LA. Um, they actually were some of the first who really used collaboration as a strategy for improvement, and it has now, all the schools are doing the same thing. It's amazing to watch. Meriden, Connecticut, on the other side, started with an extended learning time grant, but what has happened is that now they really have made professional learning the watchword. 
And I would even say, and I know this will surprise people, New York City has over 150 pro schools. There's more schools that have a school-based contract than there are charter schools in New York City. And it's been really wonderful to watch. That's about 10% of the schools. Wonderful to watch how people are taking responsibility over scheduling assignments, but it all starts with professional learning and it all starts with the key of teachers have to be, teachers, um, paras, everyone, has to be in charge of or have a real voice in the design of both the program and of the learning. How did, um, last question and then we'll open up to the audience. Um, so how do you think about the role of teacher leaders in the professional learning of other teachers and are there things that your unions are particularly trying to do to build the role of teacher leaders in this? Let me give a, um, a huge uh, shout out to the teacher leadership initiative with the National Board, the uh, Center for Teacher Quality and the NEA. Um, we now have trained uh, over a thousand individuals and that's just the beginning. This is just um, three years that we've been doing this. Uh, so we've done it in some pilot states. You can build competencies in instructional policy or association leadership. And after a foundation of uh, leadership development that would uh, suit anyone, you can then do a deeper dive in social justice, school redesign, career and college readiness, and teacher evaluation. So that we, and these are not people who are out of the classroom. These are not people who said, I'm ready to start another type of career. These are classroom teachers who said, I want to use my expertise. Um, and it is partly face-to-face. Um, -face, uh, and the rest of the follow-up is uh, with online communities. And it's not a paper-pencil test that you would take uh, the way you might get a master's program or a master's project. There are capstone projects that accompany each of these. And that comes under the relevant um, um, category. Is it real? Is it something I can use? So we, um, there's like, Three different things that we've done, um, but the what, there's one that I really, really um, am trying to grow. Again, dependent upon resources and things like that, and that's our teacher leader program. A lot of our theory of change is we do things in terms of a local level. So there are 16 locals, 14 are involved right now, several of them have grown, and each year they have about 10 people who are in the local who have become teacher leaders they do various different projects, and they learn not only leadership skills, but the whole, um, but you know, content skills, all sorts of other kinds of things, including how to actually change the local union to be much more professional oriented. Mm. Um, but we also have five locals that are involved in um, career tech ed pathways, and we're using the same kind of paradigm shift. And we also have about 10 locals who were involved. We actually have about 50 locals, as you know, that were involved in evaluation issues, 10 of whom were part of an I-3. So what we've tried to do as a through line is in each and every one of these, have the kind of um, uh, skills and the kind of values that you talked about at the beginning. Um, trust, agency, um, teach relevance, um, teacher embedded, alignment, and what's happening is that you're seeing more and more people starting to say, I'm going to just take agency. As long as we create a paradigm, they're starting to say that they're going to just take it. And that's what I love more than anything else. That's wonderful. And it, it actually reminds me of uh, something Dennis used to say all the time, proceed until apprehended, correct? Uh, <laughs> so wonderful, wonderful. This is fascinating. I could just stand up here and take notes the whole time, but I want to open it up to audience members to ask questions. If you have a question that you would like to ask to uh, Lily or Randy, then we're going to ask you to come up to the microphone um, in the center. If you don't, I have a list of burning questions, which I am very glad to ask. Um, the only thing I would like to do is to uh, assert my moderator's prerogative, since it is a learning forward conference, to Make sure that you direct your question toward professional learning and um, 
these women's views of professional learning. And also, we're supposed to be talking about teacher ownership or teachers driving their professional learning. So just keep that in mind when you're asking your question. I'd be glad to ask the first one if we have no immediate. Hello, I'm Lori. I teach in Arlington. And um, we have um, taken the lead of our professional learning at our school with um, teachers, you know, with the dot method where you put the dots where you thought you had the need. And then um, teacher teams have come together to plan the professional development. But what we found is, as we're planning for the professional learning day, which is all day, and then we have five early release Wednesdays for two hours, is that it's an enormous amount of time and we're taking 20 hours to plan because it's for our peers and we invite anybody to come to our planning session, it's taking a huge amount of time. So as I talk to other schools about that that aren't feeling very good about their professional development, they said, but who's gonna do that? We're all so busy. So whereas it's great for teachers to take the charge, but if you don't have anything taken off your plate, it's very difficult. Great question. Lily and Randy, can you give us some insight into this whole huge elephant in the room, which is where do you get the time? Time, time. Luckily, we can produce that, okay? Uh, <clears throat> not on this planet. Um, and what you're saying is uh, it, it, it is um, the biggest obstacle. But you could say that about that in anything. We need more time with our students, too. We need more time to teach. There's so much that revolves around that. The only, um, the only thing I can give you hope on, I think time has become a greater crunch since we have filled our days with things that really didn't move the needle on true teaching and learning because we were doing test prep, because we were uh, doing professional development that was maybe all about um, um, learning a new curriculum or textbook that you didn't choose and that you didn't even think was that good. And so we've wasted the valuable time that we have. What will happen when, 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 when um, the president signs the Every Student Succeeds Act? Um, it will not be that um, everything disappears. Wouldn't that be nice if all the, you know, if we just said, there, now we're done. Um, what that does is it removes the national test and punish agenda. Now, your legislatures, your school boards, are the ones that will be making these decisions. Luckily, we all have wise and wonderful state legislatures, and they'll be <laughs> listening to us. Sure. Um, that's where the next fight will be. And what we have to do is take the lead um, about the importance of time, of time to collaborate, of time to plan, of time to form those coalitions that are the undergirding of everything we're trying to accomplish. But we won't be able to just create matter. We can't just create more time. We do have to say, what is it that we've been doing in our day that we really should never have been doing in our day? It was a waste of teaching time or planning time or collaboration time. Randy, can you add anything to that? I mean, I'm thinking about the teachers who tell me about um, you know, being dragged to professional development at the end of the day when they're already really tired. Exhausted. And totally exhausted. And not to mention they've it's got a double. lot of work still to do, yeah. right, um, for the next day in terms of grading and planning. What is your view on that? Um, so this, this issue of time has been going on for time immemorial. Um, <laughs> And I do think what your colleagues were saying is right, because what's happening is that you're starting to see people do planning in an independent, teacher-led, relevant, I'm using all the words that Lynn used at the beginning, interactive. And then a lot of other things are now getting squeezed out because things haven't been taken off their plate. I think the most important management tool and I say management writ large, is that if we actually want kids to engage and teachers to um, be um, at the top of their game, 
we need to understand that we are all mere mortals and that that kind of engagement requires some priorities being, set, being, um, being drawn. And I think that the new ESSA law allows those priorities to be drawn, but we're gonna have to convince a whole bunch of legislators that they're not gonna, that, that going deep and focusing on some really core skills as well as, you know, blah, 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 whatever the blah, 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 that is the stuff that local decision makers think are important. We have to do that instead of doing everything all at once. And that's gonna have to be, that is the fight we have to take on. Um, it's, and, 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 you know, so now it's about time in the last few years, it's been about paperwork. Other years, it's about other types of things. But it is, it goes back to the core. Will you let us who know what we're doing have some latitude and control over creating priorities? Excellent, excellent. And we've got someone else from the audience. Yes, good evening. Good afternoon, rather. This is, I'm Elizabeth Davis, president of the Washington Teachers Union, and I want to thank Randy. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I want to thank Randy and Neil for being here this morning. And of course, Neil, when you said that we are hoping for wise and wonderful legislators, I'm sure you mean state and federal. We're in DC. And of course, Randy alluded earlier to teacher leaders, uh, which we have a co two cohorts that are still uh, operating in full effect and they're doing research on some of the issues that teachers in our school districts say we need to study in order to develop more student-friendly, teacher-friendly professional development. My question is, what role would teachers, as advocates, because we have clearly lost our voices in DC public schools, and in the absence of teacher voice, we have legislators and some school district leaders that are making decisions in isolation. No stakeholders are included in, in no collaboration across the board. What role can teacher leaders play in advocating for professional development that is student-centered, teacher-centered, and of course, embedded at the local school level where teachers are taking the lead on what's needed as opposed to the school district. So, the, um, so Liz is not giving herself enough credit. The teacher leaders in DC are actually going into legislators' offices, inviting legislators into their schools, if they're given permission to do it, and actually forcing people to see what teachers do and what kids do. And what the teacher's le leader program does is it people, a lot of people, look, I, I love, sorry, I love our members. I think educators around this country are some of the most heroic and wonderful people I've ever encountered. And I just, and, and to have done what they've done in the last 10 years with the kind of environment that we've been in They've just been heroic to just be willing to make a difference and that be more important than virtually anything else. And what the teacher leader program does and what the DC teacher leaders do is they can explain. They are, they are translators. They can explain to a legislator. They can explain to a policymaker. They can explain to people who don't actually care two wits about mm -hmm. um, the complex mm -hmm. solution. They can explain what's going on and what they need in layperson's English, mm -hmm. and and a lot. And what ha what I've seen in this program is people go from being very very timid to kind of sitting up straight, having confidence, being able to take agency, and a lot of that is because of the projects they do, but also the conversations and the interactions they have. And so that they actually have the confidence to show their competence. And that's what the program does. And I think that the more people we have doing that, combined with an active program to really not let legislators escape, right. is, and now with this new paradigm, because ESSA does apply to the District of Columbia, um, there may be an opportunity again. Thank Great. you. And some um, of our teacher leaders are here in and, and this conference. I know a couple are in this room right now, so thank you, Randy, great, for the program. Great, great. 
Okay, so we've only got three minutes left, so if you will ask your question as quickly as possible, and if you will answer it as quickly as possible, we'll get one more question in. Okay, mine should be very fast. Um, as we engage in professional development with teachers, uh, we are always looking for resources. Teachers, as we mentioned earlier, don't have a whole lot of time to be doing their own research all of the time. Both of you mentioned professional development, lessons in your websites. How can a teacher who is not a member of your organization's access those lessons or that piece of professional development that you offer? Well, I think um, both uh, the lesson plans that um, uh, share my lesson with AFT and better lesson with um, NEA uh, will let anyone who's even not a member in. But another thing that I want to um, direct you to is NEA is starting out like it like five minutes ago, this is brand, brand, brand new, where people do want to connect with people in their communities, elementary teachers, special ed teachers, uh, advocates for, um, for professional development that's relevant, whatever it is that is your school to prison pipeline, induction, think about all of the different issues. Um, you can go up to myNEA360, Dot org, as in I want to know about something 360 degrees. And you can be an administrator, a parent, an educator, a member, a non-member, and you will find a list right now, we've already got 80 that have started, ed communities, where you can say I want more information, I want to go up here. More and more online professional communities are sharing their best places, uh, go-to places, and we want to be a part of connecting people with um, other advocates. That's fantastic. Coloring, in Colorado, that's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Coloring, in Colorado is uh, a website you can access a whole bunch of materials for, very focused on um, ELLs, and sharemylesson.com. Um, and our new, the new iteration that starts basically in January, we'll also have um, the ability to do a bunch of these communities in the same kind of way. But that's really terrific, Ben NEA. Thank you so much. Well, to quote one of our speakers, the issue of time has been an <laughs> ongoing issue <laughs> since all of time. <laughs> How fast can you be? Very quick. It'll okay. be out and done. Carrie Dahlman, oh. Colorado. I couldn't let the opportunity pass by given uh, the three panelists that we have up there. And here's my question. From the foundation perspective, from the union perspective, what is our role or responsibility to partner together around innovative practices that will continue to drive professional learning and teacher leadership? Yeah, so I can speak really briefly to the fact that um, in the places where we've invested, um, where we've seen progress is often where unions and district leaders have come together to redesign schedules for teachers to have more time to collaborate, to think about new roles for teachers, to help lead the learning of other teachers. Um, so I think it's really hard work, right? Um, it's got lots of bumps and it actually requires a lot of compromises on both sides to keep your eye on kids and on what's important for kids. Um, but I think that's what keeps us all at the table, so. I agree. Absolutely. So I was wrong about the time. Did we go till 3.15? Great. It's, it's really great to have your moderator on top of um, the <laughs> schedule. Um, so I won't quit my day job. Um, okay, next up. Uh, Jim Miker, uh, President of the British Columbia Teachers Federation, and thanks for your advocacy. Uh, just one of the issues we're dealing with is and where you're at in terms of uh, the importance of professional development and professional learning versus uh, employer responsibility to in-service. Lily uh, uh, touched on it, you know, mandated programs and textbooks, et cetera. So where are you with uh, that difference? Um, I think we could probably, in any group of educators, have a whole session on the worst professional development you've ever had. And, you know, and painful memories come back to you about having to sit there for a some sit and get that meant absolutely nothing to you, but some Buddy needed to check off their list that they get, did an in-service with your faculty. Hopefully those days are gone. They will 
we, we, can, we can usher in the end of those days if we proceed until apprehended. Until, if we say, let the educators, let the people who know the names of the kids help direct the professional development of this learning community, not just individuals saying, I need three more credits to move up the, uh, the pay scale or whatever, that this is meaningful to me as an educator. And I will tell you where we are hearing from our own members that the best professional development they've ever had has been collaboration that those aren't two different things. Well, there's collaboration time, and then we need time for professional development. As you, as you institutionalize um, collaboration time amongst the people who work with those children, they're learning from each other, they're designing, they're developing, they're trying it out. They're learning uh, what needs to be responded to and changed. They said the best professional development I ever had was collaborating with my own colleagues. Yeah, but I think there is a tension there. I mean, you know, we have the same problem you guys do, which is continuing education credits drive a lot. Um, and in the research we've done for Teachers Know Best, you know, if you ask teachers mm -hmm. about what they value, what they tend to talk about is working together, looking at student work. They typically don't describe that as professional development. What they describe as professional development is sort of compliance-oriented stuff that they don't want. Um, so we have a real sort of ways to go still, I think, in bridging that divide. Um, I agree with, um, with Lynn. I think that the, um, the climate of sanction and punish and of regulation as opposed to innovation that we've been living under for the last 15 years, um, maybe even longer than that, uh, we need to do some more attention to that climate and to try and do what we can to continue to bust that up. Um, it's changing a lot, but this is what I would recommend on a, on a local level right now. And I wrestle with this question all the time on the issue of when you see great strategies or great practices, how do you find a way not to tell one district, do exactly what ABC did? Mm -hmm. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's not replication. It's taking strategies and trying to customize them and tailor them for whatever the local environment is. But the strategies, the more you see good strategies, how do you sustain and scale them? So part of what we need to do is places which have done what Lily and Lynn just said, places what, that have done what our Colorado colleague just said, places that are doing really good professional practice. How do we find a way to actually get them into your hands or get them into our state leaders' hands and say, we need to get rid of the brush, fire he brush here so that we can use this here as CLE, or, or C, whatever the continuing um, uh, ed courses are. Um, this here instead of the in-service. And have a bigger crosswalk for what it is that teachers need to know and be able to do in order to help kids know and be able to do. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Rajni Galloway. I'm a proud member of the WTU. I'm also a teacher leader and a professional development facilitator, and I'm a millennial. So my question is, how are both organizations developing quality PD for non-classroom teachers, i.e. librarians, counselors, social workers, educational psychologists, and speech pathologists? Um, specifically, we're starting out that with uh, the ed communities so that specific uh, um, groups can find like-minded um, um, brothers and sisters on those communities. But also when we go back to the uh, teacher, uh, to the TLI program for uh, the leadership initiative uh, with the National Board and the Center for Teacher Quality, um, that's open to everybody because we don't see um, teacher leaders as necessarily anyone that got elected to a position. 
you care about your professional integrity. You are demanding professional respect. You want to lead on that. And so that is open for the entire family of educators. That's a terrific question. Um, you know, it's funny because I was talking to a lot of teachers working on our white paper and uh, one of the teachers who teaches just a foreign language said, I get tired of um, going to all day PD and I ask a question 30 minutes into it and the guy says, oh, this probably doesn't really pertain to you, right? And he's like, and now I got another six hours of this. Meanwhile, there is something I could learn, but I'm not going to. So um, interesting issue. I'm wondering from um, Lily and Randy, what do you think, what are your teachers saying about the kinds of professional learning experiences where they really do have agency, where they have some voice and choice in it? Um, I mean, I, he I hear teachers saying that two PLCs, all PLCs are not alike, that in one district it can be done with fidelity and the teachers have a lot of agency and choice and make decisions and in others, it's sort of hijacked and it's a compliance checklist just like anything else. So I'm just interested in, in what you all think about what teachers can do to um, have more agency in their professional growth. Okay, I don't mean this to be funny. But that's why people have unions. That's why people have unions. Mm -hmm. Because you can't... Um, look, power never yields willingly. I'm not, I don't, I don't mean this to be rhetorical or ideological. It doesn't yield willingly. And frankly, a lot of the status quo in education, unions were created to combat that. And people want to have change and the flexibility to do what they need to do, but they want to be treated with respect and dignity, both economically and professionally. So this is where things like you know, surveys, student surveys, educator surveys, they can give you some data to reinforce. But at the end of the day, collaboration is only real if it's not total consensus, but it's only real if people say that their voices were really heard and that they feel like, and, and it has to be mission driven, and you can actually measure it and you can sustain it but it's hard, hard work. Mm. And, and so you can go into a school, I'm sure Lily can do the same thing, within about 30 minutes to an hour, you can smell, you can feel, you can see with the body language where there's real collaboration, where there's real agency. If you're a school's person, you can see it. And it's harder, I think, you know, Lil's, Lil's practice area was elementary, mine was high school. You know, high school teachers sometimes are more cynical but you can see it in a high school as fast as you can see it in an elementary school. And so when people will say and talk about, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you um, if it's real collaboration, if there's real agency, but it's hard to do. Mm. And it's hard to sustain unless you have uh, an environment that where people are willing to allow you to take those risks. Let me, add to, mm -hmm. let me add to that, because that, this is a, um, this is a fundamental question, and Randy's right when she says that's what unions are for. But we're being called on to do something different than we were called on to do 30 years ago. All of those, the sit and get, we sometimes helped negotiate those contracts that said, <laughs> here's your salary schedule, and you need to have so many hours of professional development, and so much has to be a university class, and so much can be a district workshop, because we were looking for something that said, um, you know, what's the best way to reward someone for investing in their profession and all of the other things that we uh, tried to do? And the result was, with all the best of intention, a checklist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there, why wouldn't some of our own members turn around and say, well, I don't really thank my union for um, something that's working for me right now. We understood the intention. But if you're a good union, and we are, then you have to be responsive to those members that say, now we need something different. And that's why when you asked, you know, about professional 
um, development about collaboration. By the way, we could do the same thing right now if we weren't careful. We could say, oh, let's have so many hours of collaboration in our contract, or we'll get that in a state law, that you must have these many hours. And we'd be right back, because someone would say, voila, go collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, and no one showed us how to do that. No one modeled it. We didn't learn it in undergraduate school. It's hard to collaborate. We can't assume that you're going to have uh, the five fifth grade teachers at Orchard Elementary where I taught all agree on what we should be doing for a, a project that year. What do we do when we disagree? There's a system. There, there are skills to actual collaboration. So what a union needs to do is to say, what is it that will truly empower my members, that will give them what they need to make this work for them and for the students that they want to spend their lives serving? And shame on us if we go back to some easy place that just says, just give me the hours, put it in a contract, we'll check the box. Um, we're better than that. Our members are demanding something better from their leaders, and that is what this is all about, that the leaders who will take us to the next level are the best amongst us. They're the people who are willing to give 100 and whatever percent. Um, and I like to think that Randy and I uh, represent those folks that say we want something better, and that's the road we're on right now. That's great. Thank you. I'm, I shudder at the thought of a teacher agency checklist. That could, could happen as well. They signed up. Okay, we had our California teacher who was in right. at my table at lunch, so right. I feel compelled I'm sorry. to let you we ask your question. I got the last word. But really, let me just, I, let me just also yeah. say that's sure. why I love, I use it a lot as an example. That's why I love the, the school-based contracts where people are taking a structure that we have created and taking the empowerment. Mm -hmm. and actually using a structure that allows them to change things from the base contract to tailor it to the needs of kids and the needs of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, that's the empowerment that I think that was, is the intent underlying yeah. what Lil was just talking about. Great. Sorry. Hi, that's okay. I think teachers are actually doing a pretty good job of collaboration. Uh, there's a great willingness to collaborate and a great wantingness to collaborate. But sometimes what happens is we'll get all some of the finest minds in the district together for a meeting. And then the district will say, well, here's the agenda. And we're saying, no, 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 no. We have to make our own agenda. And we have to work on an agenda together. What can we do and how can we uh, express ourselves better to get the uh, our districts and our admins to understand that collaboration is not letting us into a meeting and having us be there and say, well, yeah. we're now a collab in my uh, district, we're a collaboration 4.0, and really we should be a collaboration 1.0 because that's really where we are in terms of working together across and, and bridging those synapses between us. So again, some of it is what you've already said, but we need some strength there and we need some assistance there, I think, in terms of how to, um, to make collaboration, uh, w the language of collaboration, clear to everyone. That, so we know that when you're speaking about collaboration and when I'm speaking about collaboration, we're sort of talking about the same thing. Thank you, that's a great question. And ladies, take all the time you need within the next 20 seconds to answer it. <laughs> um, just to reiterate that there are on the ground right now, um, locals and sometimes entire states that are grappling with this, they see it as union work. And where it's working, you, re you, you have to start with, are we all on the same page? Are we all using the same definition? Collaboration isn't that I invited you to observe my meeting and here's the agenda. Um, but where we see it most powerful is on the building level where the people who actually have to make it work say, we've come to an agreement that this is what it's going to look like in our school, a positive uh, restorative justice um, agenda for discipline, what we're going to do on college and career, what we're going to do for English language learners, what we're going to do to involve parents. They've done it. 
um, in a very thoughtful way. And the, re the reason it works is because the administration and the union and the individuals within those structures all want to do the right things for kids. So normally in that, when a question like that is asked of me, I was, and I was, if I, I would say, okay, what local or what school? And we develop some kind of action, somewhat humorously, to try to get people laughing and out of their zone of stupidity, which is basically what you were saying your administrators were, essentially. So this is without knowing anything about your school, local, anything. So I'm, I'm basically, I don't know anything, okay? What I would do is I would then invite them to a meeting. Do it around a restaurant, do it at a bar, do it somewhere, and put your agenda out there and say, this is what we would like to talk about at this meeting. And just to start, and if they won't come, then you do something with the board, you do something with others, but do it with, I'm, I'm gonna go with what my mother used to teach me, which is do it with a smile. She was a second grade teacher. <laughs> do it with a smile, do it with that resolve and that resilience that you have right now. And so we do, we educate. So you're educating adults as opposed to children, but think about it that way as an action. That, so thank you. Um, I want to thank Lynn and Randy and Lily for educating us and helping uh, us all to help teachers to become uh, really some of the leaders of the professional learning and their profession. So thank you very much. Have a good day.